Hey everybody, it's Bill Corbett here from RiffTracks.com and I'm here to introduce today's Mystery Science Theater 3000 movie, Parts, colon, The Cloners Horror. The word colon is not actually in the title, it's just Parts, The Cloners Horror. Anyway, um, it does concern clones, as you might infer from the word clonus, and it also has performances by two mainstays of 60s and 70s American television. One, Mr. Peter Graves from Mission Impossible, if you're as old as me, or uh, from Biography, as, as we reference about a million times in the movie itself. Um, also, there is one of the two dicks from Bewitched. This is Dick Sargent, not Dick York. Do not confuse them, please. Um, playing a very bland scientist. He, he never w is not bland, God bless him. Um, and the whole plot is about uh, people, rich white people, sort of uh, raising c dumb clone versions of themselves so that they can harvest their organs just in case, which seems like a pretty tiny eventuality to prepare for, and yet an entire city is based on this. Um, the clones are extremely dumb, though, making me wonder if something else went wrong along the way. Um, for the host segments, we had the metafiction of the evil space children continuing. That was Michael J. Nelson, Bridget Nelson, and Paul Chaplin dressed as hideous little children. And in this particular episode, they're babysitting the kids, and they try, among other things, Mike does a Mexican children's TV show, and he wears tiny booty shorts. It's it's pretty rough, I won't kid you. And poor old Bobo, Professor Bobo, takes a real beating in the crotch in this in this episode. Uh, you'll you'll wince a couple of times along with Bobo. Anyway, enjoy episode eight eight eleven parts the Clonus Horror. Hey everybody, it's your pal Bill Corbett here from RiffTracks.com introducing today's Mystery Science Theater three thousand movie. And today we have episode eight twenty one. Time Chasers. This is really fresh in my mind because we just did this as a Rift Tracks uh, live show for Fathom Events. We completely rewrote the script, but it was good going back to the original and remembering our first bit of pain from Vermont. Yes, the movie was made in Vermont with all Vermont actors. Uh, fresh off their dairy farms and their jobs as security guards. Um, there's a bunch of uh, Revolutionary War reenactors in it who, who really just look like they just got off their shift at Jiffy Lube and threw on some kind of cardboard hat. It is a delight. And it posits the idea that time travel is just a bunch of... It's molecules moving around and you go in a plane, an old plane, and then blue stuff happens around you and voila, time travel. Um, this, this was interesting when we did it as a live show because the people in the movie, it was one of our most recent movies, meaning it was filmed just a couple of years before we did it on the show. So the people who did it are still alive and well, and they came to our recent Rift Track show, and it was a little weird because they were about to get <laughs> insulted by us, which is why we met them before the show. Anyway, a couple of the host segments. We had an elaborate time tra travel bit in this one where a crow goes back and tries to save Mike from his future, and he's a dum dumb working in a Wisconsin cheese co-op with a hairnet. Um, and then and the alternate future where Mike's brother Eddie is on board and he's just a, a drunken Wisconsin, sorry, that was repetitive. He was a Wisconsin guy, um, very mean version of Mike. It is one of Michael J. Nelson's tour de force performances playing the, the dick version of himself. Um, anyway, uh, hope you enjoy it. Episode 821, Time Chasers. Hey everyone, Bill Corbett here from RiffTracks.com and I am here to introduce today's Mystery Science Theater 3000 movie, episode 907, Hobgoblins. Hobgoblins is, of course, a, a fairly obvious and cheap ripoff of the Gremlin series, but without its subtle charms. Um, this is actually attempting to be a comedy we surmised in parts, but they forgot to include, you know, funny stuff like humor um, and stuff that you would laugh at. Pretty essential to a comedy. Uh, it stars, well, it features a bunch of actors who are in their 30s playing super horny teens, which is always edifying to watch. And they, they indicate their horniness by saying things like, I'm really horny, by trying to have phone sex, and by thrusting their pelvises at each other a lot. So, subtle. 
The uh, the gremlins themselves, uh, sorry, the hobgoblins themselves don't pay, play a huge part until the very end when uh, everything goes to hell. But disappointingly, the 30-year-old teens are not murdered en masse by them. Ah, them's the breaks. Uh, for the host segments, Crow, seeing the way that women are treated in the film, does a documentary on women, and his conclusion asserts that women probably do not exist. Um, good job. Uh, there's an attempt at escape by using a cardboard cutout of Mike and the Bots. And a personal note on this, the Hobgoblin song that Mike and the Bots sing has been memorized in its entirety by my children. And at the drop of a hat, they will sing it for you if you ever meet them. There's a lot of intrigue about Pearl's new precious couch, uh, and she's willing to uh, maim everybody in protecting it. Uh, anyway, I hope you will enjoy episode 907, Hobgoblins. Well, hey everybody, it's Bill Corbett here from RiffTracks.com, and I'm here to introduce today's Mystery Science Theater 3000 movie, episode 909, Gorgo. Gorgo, um, of course, if you know anything about him, was sort of a Godzilla, either homage or ripoff, depending on your point of view. Um, it's set in the UK, so um, interesting. It's a very reserved monster movie, not nearly enough crushing like they do in Japan, not enough destroying of landmarks, but, uh, you know, they're a very reserved people. Um, I, I read something on Wikipedia that I loved about this. They thought about setting it in Australia, but the producers concluded that no one would care if Gorgo destroyed Australia. Sorry, man. <laughs> Crikey! Um, Gorgo at some point gets captured by a circus run by a guy named Dorkin. We had a lot of childish jokes about that. We And it's fairly non-specific because Dorkin is not really a euphemism for anything, but we decided to imply that it was. It stars, and I use the word loosely, William Sylvester, who you also saw in Mission Science Theater episodes Devil Doll and uh, Riding with Death, the guy who couldn't stop cleaning his glasses. He is a blander than bland man. You will just forget him instantly. In fact, one of the skits was William Sylvester trivia and Mike and the Bots kept forgetting, forgetting in the middle of the game who he was. Um, also, um, in the segments, Mary Jo Peel went to meet TV critic, uh, movie critic uh, Leonard Malton, who actually gave it a good, gave Gorgo a, a positive review in his, in one of his compilation books, and she went there to excoriate him for his idiotic choice. He was a great sport about it. He's still wrong, though, folks. Don't listen to the man. Uh, we did a pretentious sketch called Waiting for Gorgo. Huh? Theater major here. And uh, the Nanites uh, ran a circus and many of them died. Sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, enjoy episode 909, William Sylvester in Gorgo. Well, hey there, friends. It's Bill Corbett from RiffTracks.com, and I'm here to introduce today's Mystery Science Theater 3000 movie, episode 1002, Girl in Gold Boots. And indeed, those boots were gold. Um, it does deliver on its promise. This is a world set in the seamy 1960s uh, Sunset Strip. Uh, Go-go dancers abound. Petty thugs are all over the place. They all kind of look the same. They're guys in boxy suits with mustaches. We were calling them the Armenian gangsters, which is probably fairly racist. Sorry about that. Um, in this, Buzz, a, a young thug who everybody calls a kid, even though the guy, honest to God, is pushing 40, uh, comes into this world of go-go dancers and tries to, uh, tries to score with the ladies and with the crime. Um, there's also another character called Critter, who is the blandest folk singer in the world. Um, Critter is just not a name that works for me. You expect a, a biker of some sort. Nope, guys, uh, guy has an acoustic guitar. There are many, many scenes of go-go dancing that are supposed to be sexy. They come off as terribly sad, really. Um, this, these contain some very alarming host segments. Uh, Pearl, the overarching fiction is that Pearl is trying to become an accredited ma mad scientist. At some point, uh, Crow decides to become a go-go dancer. He, so you just see his legs, it's very funny, but it's implied that he is nude up above, which begs the question, when is he not nude? Um, but later on, and this is, this is a moment that lives in infamy in our show, <laughs> Brain Guy, 
decides to become the girl in gold, gold boots and become a gold, uh, become a go-go dancer, excuse me, uh, performing for Pearl and the, the mad scientist accreditor. It is, it is really one of the most hideous things that has ever been on basic cable. And I really, I should spend the rest of my life apologizing for it. And I, and I will from this moment on. But just be, just be ready for the last moment of the show. You, you might want to have a barf bag. Um, anyway, enjoy <laughs> episode 1002, The Girl in Gold Boots. Hey folks, it's Bill Corbett here from RiffTracks.com, and I'm here to introduce today's Mystery Science Theater 3000 movie, episode 1009, Hamlet. And yeah, it is that Hamlet, written by that hack, William Shakespeare, probably back in the 1930s or so. Anyway, he, uh... <laughs> It was a it was a weird choice for us. I'd be the first to admit we um, we found it sitting around in a bunch of our uh, bag of movies with a bunch of other uh, stinky sci-fi stuff and decided, hmm, what if? So we had a fiction around it where Pearl loses a bet to Mike and Mike decides to turn the tables and try a good piece of drama for a while and ask for Hamlet and she gives him this turgid. German TV version of it, and it is a pretty, pretty bad version of it. It has uh, Maximilian Schell, a respected actor, um, and a bunch of other probably pretty good German actors, but they're all speaking English and they're not comfortable with it. The guy who plays Polonius sounds almost exactly like Hogan's Heroes Sergeant Schultz, the I Know Nothing guy. Um, so it was an interesting experiment, beloved by some, not so beloved by others. We did, uh, we did some Hamlet-based skits around it. Uh, the bots do their all-percussion version of Hamlet, sort of mocking the, uh, the tendency of theater directors to be a little bit, try to put their signature on Shakespeare after trying a scuba version of Hamlet and other things. Uh, Mike hosts a game show in full Elizabethan drag called The Last Poor Who, where we have to identify the, the bones, the disinterred bones of celebrities, some of whom are not even dead, and no questions asked on how we got them. And of course, Kevin comes in at the end as Prince Fortinbras, as happens in Hamlet. Anyway, I hope you enjoy episode 1009, Michael J. Nelson's William Shakespeare's Hamlet. <laughs> 